Good morning, everyone. After a week of Without Political Science 303, I know you've missed this class very much. Therefore, you have an in-class assignment. I know how much you missed writing papers for this class. So you have an in-class assignment on Thursday at 1 p.m. Um, so that we write it down in about 25 minutes, okay? S on Thursday, 1 p.m., you, you must have received an email through Stars Airs. If you haven't done so, you have to see either me or somebody else for this. The in-class assignment will be on Brexit, okay? Why Brexit happened. Uh, according to one political scientist um, who teaches um, on um, refugee issues, mi migration issues, and globalization, and especially globalization of labor and migration. So um, please watch the TED Talk. It's going to be a TED Talk, as announced. It's less than 20 minutes. I think it was about 17 minutes or so. I found it very, you know, amusing to watch. It was, um, it flows. It's a, it's a nice talk um, by a colleague from the UK. Um, and um, I, we will be asking you one question out of it, which is more of a discussion question rather than, okay, tell me what year did Brexit or what day Brexit happened or what day uh, the referendum on the Brexit happened, okay? So, so rather than an information question, think about a discussion uh, question or discussion topics, okay? Um, for this assignment, you're entitled to bring, you're allowed to bring one page uh, with your handwritten notes, not in pencil, but in colored pen, okay? Or in colored pencil. Um, whatever you want, but it shouldn't look like a photocopy, like a Xerox copy. I want you to note down your ideas, your own ideas. Therefore, I, I won't allow any plagiarism either from a text or from a friend of yours. Okay, no copying. So, so um, please follow the instructions. You will be handing in the A4 paper, paper with your, um, with your in-class assignment. Uh, before I continue with this, you will be writing in total two assignments. I will be giving three assignments. You're entitled, you're, you're, you can write only two of these. You can't write a third. So pick and choose the fight you want to pursue. Um, in each of these in-class assignments, it'll be something similar to this. A video or an article or an article and a video um, on a current issue that um, reaches or that is at the top of the political agenda of these um, case countries. Okay? So in total, you, you're required to write two. Um, you should be able to pick two out of three, but the, this is the upside to it. The downside to it is that um, there will be no makeup for an in-class assignment. So if you miss, if you don't take the first and miss the second, you will be losing five points according to our contract, which is the syllabus, okay? So, so uh, please make sure that you either take it or you don't fall sick, okay? So that you come to class and write the assignment. Um, now, any questions on anything? On the assignment or, or Britain? Any questions about Britain, which we have completed uh, last week around this time? We didn't have class on Friday because of the Jumuriyet Bayramah the Republican Day, or Republic Day, I'm sorry. So um, 
my plan today is to discuss, it's to start my discussion on France. Okay? So, um, and in about two weeks, we'll write a midterm. So the midterm will be comprised of questions in or on Britain and France compared. So two major cases, but think of these at the back of your minds, but there won't be any direct question coming out of those pieces uh, that, that, you have, um, that you've already written a quiz on. The results of the quiz will be announced before next class on Friday. So um, we're still going over them. Um, and, and here is France, if there are no questions. No questions. All right, um, we'll do exactly the same thing uh, for France in comparison to Britain. Um, remember, we first talked about the British history in or the British history or state tradition in historical perspective. So we'll do French state in historical perspective or history of political history of France, how the French um, republics came into being in the 21st or 20th century, and then where we are in terms of um, you know, politics and power in the 21st century. Then political economy of economic and social policies, uh, economic development, social development, um, followed by governance and policy making, where we'll look at the executive and its relationship with the other organs of state, and, um, and also the French model of uh, statehood. You know, what's the administrative system like in France? Fourth, we'll talk about representation and participation. And finally, we'll, um, we'll discuss some current challenges. And then we'll be writing our midterm. Okay? So um, whenever you, we, we, I talk about or you think about France, think of it in comparative terms with what we've discussed for Britain. Okay? So, so you, should, you should keep that in mind. All right. Um, a little bit to start. What does France look like? You know where France is on the map. And um, we have 22 plus 5 regions um, in France that make up France. Um, five of these are overseas regions. Uh, Corsica, which is off the coast, but Guadeloupe, um, French Guiana, Martinique, and Réunion are the, are the other areas, other regions of France. Um, we have 96 to 100, I mean, 96 departments, plus five overseas departments, around 100, 101 overseas departments. Departments, think of departments as provinces or small scale provinces. Uh, compare that to, to Turkey, if you, if you will. Um, France is in the temperate climate or enjoys a temperate climate. As you can see, it has, it's coastal. It has coasts on the Mediterranean and also uh, on the Atlantic. Right across is, the, um, is, the, is Britain. Uh, as an island. We've got the channel, um, the tunnel, um, and um, which, which, which connects Britain to, to France. Uh, very large, quite large, one of the largest areas in Europe, one of the you know, uh, largest countries in Europe, populated quite densely, about 63, uh, I'm sorry, it used to be 63, now it's 66 million. So we have 66 million inhabitants in France. Um, it is very much fertile, so it is very amenable to agriculture. Um, also because of the temperate climate it, it enjoys. And um, the French state, as we shall be talking about, is a unitary state. It's a highly centralized unitary state. So unlike Britain, we have 
yes, a unitary state, but this is a more centralized form of unitary state. Okay? It's very hierarchical. The, the center is very much powerful in comparison to Gesundheit, in comparison to what we've seen in France. Uh, Population-wise, it is widely, it is heavily uh, populated, um, but in comparison to, um, to Britain, which is about 60 million, um, which is around the same. Uh, but when you compare that to, to Germany, which is around 80, 81 million, it is less densely populated. Um, let me now turn to, after this quick introduction, um, some history. Things start with the 5th century, the breakup of the Roman Empire, 475, right? For about five centuries, France, can, France remains to be part of what's called the Holy Roman Empire. Um, the principalities, kingdoms, and all that. Uh, and then it, it, it comes under the domination of Merovingian and Carolingian dynasties. Uh, Charlemagne, by about the 8th century or 800s, becomes the king. So uh, France, Charlemagne, Charlemagne, France. Um, then Capetian monarchs dominate France. Um, in the 14th century, it was almost being dominated by France, uh, uh, dominated by Britain, um, but then defeats Britain in what's called the Hundred Years' War. So by about Istanbul was conquered, the war ends, 1453. Um, then something important happens. We have all throughout 16th century. These are basically highlights um, in French history or milestones in French history. Um, all throughout 16th century, we have religious conflict. War of re what's sometimes referred to as the war of religions. Um, Protestants, the newly born um, stream within um, Christianity, um, and Catholics come in conflict for almost 100 years, all throughout the 16th century. Then we have Henry IV uh, through the Edict of not providing toleration or religious liber liberties to the French Huguenots, uh, or sometimes, refer sometimes pronounced as Huguenots. Um, so, so French Protestants um, are being given religious toleration. So that's about the end of 16th, very early 17th century. OK, so that's, that's important. Then um, France rivals England in its claims to North America. Um, up north, French territories in Quebec, uh, which, I mean, part of Canada is called sometimes, I mean, in history it was called Nouvelle France, New France. Um, so Quebec was the area there. And down south, we have Louisiana. Which, which came under uh, French influence. So, so French, the French and the British, the English then, really rival one another, are competing for those territories in North America. They want to colonize those places, they want to keep their colonies to themselves, and they fight over those colonies overseas. Okay, so, so colonial wars with Britain, but overseas. Um, as you can see, there's so much competition between Britain and France in the 17th century, 18th century. Um, but then France was defeated in Seven Years' War in 1750s, 1760s. Um, but about this time, let me go back to 16th century, another milestone in, in French history, which we uh, talked about very briefly. Uh, when I was talking about the absolutist regime, remember? Um, we've got the Ancien Regime, which crystallizes in the 17th century, so early 1600s. Yes, throughout the 1500s, there, were, uh, there was some um, century pedal tendencies, some centralization um, emerging, 
in France, in the French lands back then. But with the 17th century, we have um, the Bourbon regime controlling much of contemporary France and builds um, what's called you know, the absolutist state. Absolutist states are characterized by strong bureaucracies and that they were territorial. Remember, we talked about this in much more detail. These bureaucracies were of two kinds, tax collection and, very good, military bureaucracies. So um, Louis XIV says, l'état c'est moi, um, the state, it's me. So he says, OK, I am the absolute ruler here. It's a certain type of uh, early modern state that comes to the historical scene. And it really lays the groundwork for what's called the modern state. Okay? Um, and by about the mid 17th until about the mid 18th year, uh, 18th centuries, we have frequent war and stagnant economy. So France comes under war. Um, it's, there's, there's, there's frequent war with, with her neighbors. Um, and also, its economy is stagnating. So, and, and, and compare that to Britain. When did industrialization in Britain start? In Britain. First industrialization, 18th century. So by about mid-18th century, industrialization starts in Britain, but we have stagnant economic activity here in France. So France did not industrialize when Britain industrialized. It, it became a follower. It became, because of its stagnant economy, because economic activity was low in terms of levels, it remained um, in, in some sense underdeveloped or undeveloped or in a way backward, okay, in comparison to her arch rival, Britain. Um, stagnant economy, the regime pressures, pressures um, peasants even more with taxes and from one standpoint we've got the French Revolution. We'll talk about this in more detail. But what's important here is that um, absolute state, so a certain type of state, reigning France or dominating France, um, the Bourbon dynasty, it's a monarchy. We've got the king with absolute powers uh, coming to power and frequent warfare, stagnant economy. Then we end up with the French Revolution. What does the French Revolution look like? Um, in this juncture, critical juncture, we have the monarchy and the Ancien Regime being toppled. Okay? Uh, Parisian crowds reign or they, they, they run into uh, the French um, state-controlled prison in Bastille, which is in central Paris. They raid, uh, storming into Bastille, and they free the prisoners. So the prisoners of the Ancien Regime have been freed. So we have a new, um, new regime that is in the making. This was a revolution, quite a big social change, political change, with all kinds of ramifications, cultural ramifications, but also social, uh, religious, um, political, as well as economic. It was a nationalist or national revolution in the sense that people were given the right to choose, or people thought that they were given the right to choose which nation they, they wish to belong. Um, and, and by this, the monarchy, the Bourbon monarchy, the Ancien Regime, was undone. So, so it was, in that respect, um, a national or nationalist revolution. It was abolished, uh, but later state institutions, as we shall be seeing, state institutions were reinforced. That was the irony of the French Revolution. Um, but it was also an international revolution, which inspired all of Europe, 
and also elsewhere. So the ideas of, or the ideals of, the three ideals of the French Revolution, which inspired not only societies, peoples in Europe, but also elsewhere. What were these three ideals which, represents, which represent the flag, the French flag? Liberté, liberty, equality, and fraternity. Brotherhood. Okay. Uh, liberty is the blue, equality is the white, and brotherhood is the blood, okay, is the red. So, so uh, these ideals have influenced um, not only societies right next to France, but also elsewhere. You've, you've, we've all um, read about the decline of the Ottomans, for example, in our, in our history textbooks. Um, it was, in a way, a liberal revolution because it brought with it individual liberties, the idea of, or the motto of liberté. So the idea, the ideal of liberalism, or individual liberty, but also secularism. The idea of secularism, okay, it's, it's we had the entire 16th century, one century of bloodshed in the name of religion. Catholicism versus Protestantism. Okay? Um, therefore, the, uh, the French, the new system, the new regime after the revolution meant, excuse me, so, so let's forget about the past. Let's start a new, new future. And let it be, this time, secularism. By secularism, the French mean laïcité, the idea of What's the difference between laïcité and secular way of life? Laïcité and secular way of life. Secular way of life, yes, you may be religious, but you, I mean, you, you, you put your, your religious ideas, ideals on the side, and you lead a life. So, you, I mean, you, your, your, your life, it's not dictated by the precepts of, and the principles of religion. Uh, this is for individuals or societies. But if you want to describe a state as secular, you, you generally refer to it with the, uh, with the separate, it's, it's a specific term called laïcité. Um, so so when, it, when we talk about uh, statehood, when we talk about states, secular states, we, we refer to the French word laïcité, uh, the ideal after the 16th century, the entire 16th century with the French Revolution, the, uh, with the, you know, the liberal revolution, we refer to it as the uh, you know, laïcité, um, secularism in that respect. It was a democratic revolution in the sense that from those years onwards, we have all citizens. All citizens are being on an equal footing, or all citizens should enjoy equal rights, qualitative as well as quantitative rights, all, all, all different kinds of rights. Um, so, so this was, in a way, a, a, a revolution which brought with it all kinds of changes, um, transformation, um, ruptures, not continuities, uh, like or, or as opposed to what we've seen in Britain. Remember the Glorious Revolution? We don't talk about all this kind of stuff. Yes, you know, religious, um, the, the question of religion had been resolved, but, but this was a massive rupture with history. Whereas in Britain, we had some kind of incremental change um, or incremental progress. But here, we have the old order being undone, abolished, a new system was put into place. And then we will, have, uh, we will see that new systems will also be being put in place later on. Immediate aftermath of the French Revolution, we had a reign of terror. Um, the revolutionary regime was brutally intolerant, and they were so hostile toward women, 
that the, all those ideas about the revolution, the fraternité, égalité, liberté, were really betrayed. Um, then French destabilizes once again. Um, all these instabilities come and go. Let me highlight those sequences one by one. So the French wish to call every regime, every stable-like regime, a republic. Okay? Um, what happened was with the French Revolution, the idea of a republic as a regime emerged. What's, what does republic mean? Republic. I don't mean Plato's The Republic, but what do we mean in, in political science? What do we mean when we say republic? It's a form of government. Yes, we've got citizens instead of subjects. OK, yes. But what's important here is that compare, not necessarily, compare that to the Ancien Regime. Not necessarily, generally, not necessarily, but generally, yes. But what's important here, contrast that to the monarchy. In monarchies, we have rulers with blood ties. So it's hereditary. In republics, it's a form of government in which we do not have hereditary institutions or hereditary um, power, OK? So rulers, they don't, they don't follow a dynasty, OK? They change over time, all right? So the ideal of republicanism or republic here is that there was a rupture between uh, the Ancien Regime, which was a monarchy, centralized monarchy versus republics, OK? So whenever we talk about monarchies, we don't talk about republics. So in that respect, is Britain a nation state? Somebody said nation when I asked republic. Is Britain a nation state? It is a nation state, yes. Oh, you said now. I'm sorry. Is Britain a democracy? Yes. Is Britain a republic? OK, is that clear? Do we understand the difference between republic and monarchy? Uh, and, and these categories of democracy, nation, or nation state, or nationalism, and, um, and republic. Anyway, um, so first republic, immediately after uh, the, uh, the, the French, the Great Revolution. Um, Napoleon Bonaparte, who was an army general installs a coup and declares himself as emperor, 1802. Um, he declares himself as the first emperor. Okay? So he installs an empire. Um, but then in about 15 years, he was defeated by the English. So again, French-British rivalry. And then monarchy is restored, meaning that the first republic ends. OK? So First Republic ends um, because monarchy is restore, restored. Um, Second Republic, uh, about 30 years later, there was an uprising against the ruling monarchy in between these, these um, republics, that there was a revolution. And there was a republic for three years. OK? So a new regime comes to power. Louis Napoleon, who happens to be um, Napoleon Bonaparte's nephew and his heir, says, I'm the, the emperor, I'm the king. But later on, Franco-Prussian War and the revolutionary upheaval producing the Paris Commune, civil war, 1870s, weaker government, democracy for a year. So again, everything goes down the drain. Um, for after three years, and then its aftermath, we go back to 
some kind of monarchy and instability. Third Republic after the Paris Commune, um, 1871. Um, this becomes more durable, in, uh, which, which lasts about 40, another 30, about 70 years. Okay? We see the emergence of a parliamentary system. So we have a parliament with a weak executive because the, the founding fathers are thinking these were strong executives. Let's now change it to a weak executive and a strong parliament. Okay? But this system also ends up with the Nazi invasion, Nazi occupation, 1939-1940. So, um, so the Third Republic gets undone. Um, when we look at the period between the early 19th century and the pre-war period, pre-World War II period, we see an oscillation between strong parliament, weak executive, or weak parliament, strong executive, republic versus monarchy. So um, monarchy and some kind of radical democracy, those democratic ideals, um, whether it, it would fly. Um, but when we look at this, we see frequent regime change. So regime, the French, I mean, in this period, for about more than 100 years, we have frequent turnover in terms of not so lasting regimes, right? First Republic, monarchy, second Republic, upheaval, third Republic, upheaval, well, war, and then there will come the fourth Republic. So up, up until the fourth Republic, end of World War II, we have French system, French state being really imbalanced and also very, I mean, the French system as, as in very highly unstable system, okay? So political instability could characterize as all this, this almost a century and a half. Um, the enduring questions linger, state autonomy. So remember that this comes from a French, French style absolutist state. So the, the French way of organizing your state, autonomy from society, state autonomy from others, insulated state or insulated policy making from its societal sectors versus democratic participation of, of internal groups, which was, which emerged especially after the French Revolution. So um, the pendulum swings between not only monarchy and radical democracy, but also state autonomy versus democratic participation. And state autonomy, democratic participation, state autonomy, democratic participation. So, so it's, it's a back and forth movement all the time. Highly unstable. Secularism, 16th century, um, war of religion or religions, but the French ideal of secularism had not been settled. Yes, it is there in the French Revolution. It is an ideal, but still an unresolved question at the back of the French psyche in terms of its citizens. Uh, political conflict continues. Instability continues. In the meantime, so when we look at, I mean, we, we talked about the fact that Britain industrialized by about the mid 18th century, you know, um, light industries, late 18th century, heavy industries. We have all throughout this period, up until World War II almost, slow industrialization, slow growth. We have a large peasantry. Uh, we have limited natural resources except for some coal, which is neighboring um, France, Alsace, Lorraine. Underdeveloped entrepreneurial spirit, 
that was also um, unlike their neighbors right across the tunnel or right across the English Channel. Um, slow population growth, that's also important, and high protection through tariffs, protecting French industries against its competitors through high tariff walls. Okay, so um, which meant that efficiency of the uh, manufacturing sector, which was limited anyway, was low, productivity was also low because it wasn't in competition. Um, and also the French ideal of civilizing mission, what they call la mission civilisatrice, civilizing mission. It was also very important. Um, by this, the French meant it's white man's burden, like the British. It's white man's burden to expand, to, um, to expand French ideals, Republican ideals, um, economic growth, economic progress to elsewhere. So bring about change elsewhere. But this was used more, of, more or less as a pretext um, for finding markets as well as natural resources, um, just like in the case of Britain to a certain extent. So um, then comes war. We have a new regime installed throughout the war. It's more or less a, um, a puppet regime. It enters into an armistice with Hitler, the French state, um, which divides France into two. In the north, we have direct German control. In the south, we have an independent or quasi-independent or independent looking or seemingly independent puppet regime in Vichy, uh, which is a central uh, city in France. So, so it, it controls some parts of France, but the northern parts are controlled by the Nazis. Please. Ah, rive gauche, rive droite. Oh, I don't know that. Uh, we should look into that. It, it may have been the case. Um, but would Vichy regime include southern part of... It may be true. It may be true. I, I don't know that, but it's, it, I, it's, it's worth looking it up. Um, so, so France is divided into two. The north is under the Nazis. Uh, the Vichy government in time throughout the war years was fiercely opposed by different segments in society, especially by communists, by socialists, and by progressive Catholics. So, so there was much reaction to the German occupation up north, but there was also much reaction to the puppet regime in Vichy, the French state uh, government in Vichy. And de Gaulle, General de Gaulle, um, seizes power. He gains control over all those that rally against the Vichy regime and says, OK, I propose a new regime with strong leadership. And citizens vote for this um, for this regime, and they say, no, we don't want that. So General de Gaulle retires immediately. Um, but immediately after, uh, we see the emergence of an opposite type of regime, where we've got a strong parliament and a weak executive. This is exactly what um, de Gaulle insisted against. He said, I want a regime, because we had so much instability, I want a regime of strong executive, weak parliament. But it was defeated in the polls by citizens, and we see the emergence of a fourth republic with a strong parliament and a weak executive, 
and proportional representation. So, so as you can see, not winner-takes-all system, but a more proportional system, a more democratic system um, in its ideal form. But, which, but this brought all kinds of instabilities with it um, the, in, the, in, the, in the ensuing elections. Um, there was economic development, yes, but um, the French were involved in Vietnam in the 50s, 60s. They withdrew from Vietnam. And they also um, wanted to crush an anti-colonial uh, rebellion in Algeria. But they, the French state, the government, could not do that. And then there emerged General Gaulle out of retirement and says, hey, um, let me change things once again. And uh, he emerges uh, as prime minister and installs a new regime, which is called the Fifth Republic. So um, he and his associates draft a new constitution, um, which gives much stronger role to the executive and much weaker role to the parliament. So, as you can see, strong parliament, strong legislature, weak executive, now turning upside down, strong executive, weak legislature. So, so that's how the Fifth Republic comes into being. Um, what's important here is that we see again, again in the 20th century, the swinging of the pendulum from strong executive, weaker legislature to strong legislature, weaker executive, back to strong executive and weaker legis legislature. Okay, so, and that's where we are. And, and many observers think or see that this is going to endure. I mean, this, this last version, limited parliamentary power, weaker legislature, and stronger executive will last for some time, some more time. That this is more in tune with the French administrative system or administrative psyche. Any questions? Now that we are with the um, Fifth Republic, any questions until now? So what I want you to remember here is that we've got, we've got the pendulum swinging back and forth between radical democracy and monarchy. Radical democracy, monarchy. Okay, so one republic after another, but with dis disruptions in between. Okay, either instability or outright war, or outright puppet regime like the Vichy regime. So first republic, second republic, third republic, fourth republic, 58, 1958, fifth republic. Okay, so that's that's where we are in terms of how France enters into the 20th century. I mean, post-World War II period, um, some regime was installed, but, but this was untenable, this was unsustainable. Then a system which was quite in opposition or quite opposite to the Fourth Republic emerges. Okay, I think it's time to take a break. <laughs>